Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the AFR EMS case studies. Uh, we're here today with Dr. Kimberly Pruitt, our medical director, and Captain Rob LaPreece. My name is Chris Ortiz, I'm the EMS Division Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue. And today we're gonna to talk about an interesting case about hypothermia and ECMO. So thanks for joining us, Rob. Thank you for having me, Chief and uh, Doc, appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. All right, so everybody in the department knows Captain LaPreece, our 7-8, uh, one of our quality assurance officers. So you were dispatched, it sounds like, along with Rescue 12 and Engine 12 um, to a 32 Delta in a parking lot outside of a hotel uh, in February. That's true. It was like right around midnight. It was, uh, it was a cool night. It was a little breezy. Um, it sure felt like uh, it was going to be an overdose, and that's how, uh, that's how it ended up presenting. So I'll start from the beginning. Yeah, you guys are right on sure. So Engine 12 and Rescue 12 were there upon your arrival, I would assume, yes? Uh, yes, Engine 12 was there. Uh, they had sent uh, Rescue 5, but we canceled them. We cleared a call, so it was our call now. Engine was there. We got there. There's this 20-year-old uh, female. She's, uh, she's passed out in the uh, driver's seat of a vehicle. Um, there was uh, blue pills on the floorboard. She was agonally breathing. And uh, Engine was trying to do an assessment on her. And I got there, and I, it was just a tight fit. And I asked the guys, I said, can we just pull her out? She just looked like a 23. I was pretty fooled. But uh, they got her out, and uh, she was agonal. And I asked, does she have a pulse? They said, yes. And I said, great. Um, where's the Narcan? Are we, are we working on that? And they said, well, yeah, but she's not pinpoint. And I said, I don't care. Like, to me, she looks like an overdose. I was already breaking my own rules because I hadn't even touched her. And that's, that's my fault. I, I typically like to go into a scene and do airway breathing, radial pulse, skin temp, and then I'll step back. So, so I, it's a, but it's a sad mm -hmm. and unfortunate situation right now that we've responded to more and more of these call types, right? With younger sure. folks who are unresponsive, we have the blue pills sitting on the dash, like, this, for all intents and purposes, is an overdose. This is one we've done, unfortunately, you know, hundreds of times this month. Um, so it's it leads you to that conclusion without doing your normal assessment. And Doc, did you have more on that? I was just going to ask, can you, I think the point you just made about touching mm -hmm. the patient and doing your own assessment for ABCs, especially circulation, can you tell me why it's important to touch your patient and the kinds of things that you learn about them and their Gosh, state when you get their pulse? You learn about so much. You can feel their pulse, their rate, their quality, uh, and their skin. And their skin, to me, tells a big story. And anyone that's been my student knows, like, I insist on it. Like, I don't care if you're supposed to have a clipboard as a student. It doesn't matter to me. I want you to do airway, breathing, circulation. I want you to listen to their chest for a respiratory and feel their pulse. And, you know, we all get lax, and that was my fault. To me, it was an overdose, and I had tons of guys helping me. So I was just kind of like, you know, bring out the Narcan. Additionally, uh, they were level zero. Our unit was coming from, like, Rust Hospital. So I knew we were going to um, transport. Uh, we waited a couple minutes for the Narcan. And nothing happened. Okay. She was still agonal. So I asked the guys to grab the gurney. We put her on the gurney. I still hadn't touched her. We got her in the truck, and I was in the captain's seat. And once she rolled up, I touched her, her neck, to feel a carotid. And she was ice cold. Ice, ice cold. And I said that to everyone. I'm like, she's ice cold. And I'm like... I don't even feel a pulse. Let's cut her shirt and get the pads. And then it started from there. Okay. So the mind, the mindset kind of shifted from this being an overdose, and now her skin was so cold to the touch. So cold. February, now we're thinking this might be something different besides just an overdose. And I couldn't figure it out because we found her in the car. You know, I've thought about this case a while, and I think maybe she overdosed on the pavement somewhere, and whoever she was with got scared put her in a vehicle. I don't even know if the vehicle was hers. Mm -hmm. So I, in my mind, when we first saw her, she's an overdose in her vehicle. I didn't really expect her to be hypothermic. So yeah, so now we know she's in arrest. Put the pads on. I asked the guys, get the Lucas. 
Let's get set up for an airway. Let's get access. Let's slow it down. We're going to be transporting, but I want to get some stuff done here. So we did, uh, she was an asystole and the first, uh, the first pulse check, she was a B-fib. Uh, so we started there. We started defibrillating her, uh, giving epinephrine. And, I've, and she was in refractory fib. We couldn't change it. So I had uh, Kyla Hay drawing up everything under the sun. We started with the EpiQ10. We did uh, 300 of amiodarone. Uh, we did a, sometime in there, I don't know if in route or when, we did a vector change. And uh, I think by the time, okay, so then we, we rolled away. We had enough stuff done. I'm like, let's go. She's gonna be an ECMO patient. She's young, she's in fib. Um, refractory. She's cold. We took her temp. It was low. That's all it said. It was low. I think in the ED when we got there, it was 82? 82 Fahrenheit. So super cold. We ended up giving a second dose of amiodarone. Uh, everything went well. The crew worked really hard. I had a great team and they just kicked butt. We were just in the back of uh, Rescue 12, just working a code all the way to UM. I gave them a nice early report. They were, they were very good accepting and they kept working her hard. And as I understand it from Kim, the ECMO was a call in. One of the cantilators was a call in. So uh, they worked her like for another 45 minutes to an hour. And before she got cannulated and then we all know the results turn out pretty good. Yeah. And talk to us a little bit about mm -hmm. that, Doc, from the, the hospital's perspective. Um, we have report of what we thought initially was an overdose. We realize this is likely a hypothermic patient, so we've initiated care. Multiple defibrillations, it sounds like, because of the refractory V-fib. I think we did 11. 11 total. So based on age and all the other criteria, they met the ECMO criteria for, for in-hospital. Talk through that, what you guys are thinking on the other side, anticipating this patient. Uh, our crews have actually been doing a really good job running the checklist for inclusion criteria for ECMO. So even though this wasn't a witnessed arrest, hypothermic arrest kind of trumps some of those other things. So I'm glad that you recognized that. And then along with the refractory VFib, this is a patient that really has a high likelihood of a very good outcome, which is exactly what happens. Some of our hypothermic arrests do the best. Um, it is nice, especially since it was the middle of the night to give the hospital as much of a heads up as you can, much like the cath lab. A lot of times these uh, physicians that are doing the cannulation or the procedure are going to be coming from a different place in the hospital. And since this is such a time sensitive emergency and every second counts, it, it's good to give them a heads up to get ready, get prepared, get their stuff down there, have the doctors in place um, to be ready to cannulate when the patient arrives. So good job on the heads up. Mm -hmm. Good job on taking her even recognizing because, you know, we do tend to work arrests on scene, but recognizing that this was an ECMO candidate moving early uh, really helps. It does get a little bit crazy in the ED with a lot of hands on deck and there's a lot of people that come flowing in, but it really does help to give them a heads up that you're coming with a possible ECMO candidate. And just adding that little phrase into the radio report will, will get a lot of wheels in motion. That's good. Yeah, that heightened mm -hmm. level of awareness. And I think we've had our ECMO program in the pre-hospital setting, which is currently on pause, but we'll be coming back soon. Um, we've had it on pause, but we're typically operating during the day, Monday through Friday. Uh, but it's good to remember that not only if, th if those capabilities are not available, that the hospitals at Press Downtown and specifically UNM still have the ECMO capability and will accept those patients. So that's, that's why I tell remember. the crews, I mean, if you have someone after hours that's an ECMO candidate, just roll. Especially in those winter months that we're yeah. talking about hypothermic patients being great candidates. We've had at least three hypothermic ECMO saves this year um, that I can think of, and I think there were probably even a couple more. And they're sneaky. I had one back in October. I always tell the guys this. Um, if you're outside and you need to wear your sweatshirt, get a temp on the patient. I broke my own rule. We were, in my mind, we were beyond a temp when we saw her on the pavement. We were more Narcan, I mean, that way. So, but yeah, she was ice cold. 
Talk to us a little bit, Rob, about refractory V-fib and treatment options. You talked about how she was in refractory V-fib, 11 shocks. Um, it's not an abnormal situation for us to encounter that, especially recently. Uh, we have the new options with having amiodarone, but talk to us about some of the things you, from an EMS supervisor's perspective, want to see crews do when they're seeing refractory. That's an excellent question. I love that question. The first thing is identify recurrent fib or refractory fib, meaning recurrent would be if you have V-fib and then you shock and it's PA and your next pulse check is V-fib and it keeps coming back, you have to break that cycle. But specifically, uh, refractory V-fib is when they won't come out of V-fib no matter how many times you uh, defibrillate them. Some treatment options that I've learned from working with everyone here is early identification. Don't wait to get your antiarrhythmic going. After the first or second shock, get it on board. It shouldn't be five shocks in where you're like, oh, I should give amiodarone. It should already be on board. Do your second dose. And while you're doing that, look at other options. You can do a vector change. So the pads would normally be like this. A vector change is you take this pad, move it here, and this pad, move it behind your sc scapula. And it changes the angle of the, uh, the shock. And it's, there's been studies on it that it's proven it can work. So that's what I do. Early identification that you're in that situation. And they're viable patients. That's what, what gets me is recurrent fib or refractory fib. These people are viable. They're ready for us to save. They, you know, who do we save? Who walks away? We should look at that. Who walks away? Witness arrest bystander CPR, shockable rhythm. All the people that tell us thank you and walk out of the hospital to go back to their home that are neurologically intact, that, those are the three common denominators with all of them. So to me, it's like when you see someone like that, it's time to go. It's time to move with your care and be really smart paramedic. Mm -hmm. It's not time just to be lazy and work the code like any other code. It's not that kind of code. It's a serious code. So we talk about a lot of the measures that we've done on this call that lead to good outcomes. It sounds like this patient had a good outcome. Can you talk, doctor, about uh, what you guys saw the next day? This one in particular was a fantastic save. I looked her up the next morning. I heard about this call, was curious how she was doing, expecting a good outcome, knowing how good the crew did and what, how good the odds were that she was going to survive. And when I opened the chart, it said that she was asking for breakfast the next morning, awake and talking and totally normal. So this is an excellent save. Absolutely, we talked about the antiarrhythmics and how important they are early when you early. are seeing those uh, those refractory V-fib rhythms. Doc, do you wanna talk quickly on the two options that we have now with lidocaine, amiodarone, and any of the thoughts you have about our antiarrhythmics? Yeah, absolutely. This is an excellent mm -hmm. discussion. Um, these are the ones you wanna be top of your game. Exactly. No interruptions in CPR, defibrillating as early as you can. And the antiarrhythmics, there's actually an article that just came out in the last month. I think our training staff is disseminating it, but if there was a study done with folks in, um, shockable rhythms, amiodarone versus lidocaine, and getting the amio on in the first eight minutes had a much better neurological outcome than if you waited longer. So early epi, early amio, no interruptions and compressions has really good um, outcomes. And that vector change, I think, is really big, too, because the theory is, I don't know that anybody's proved it, but there may be one specific area of the heart that depending on the vector of the electricity that's crossing the chest may just not be affected by that electricity as much. So by changing the pads and the vector of the electricity, you may capture that, that area that needs it to reset. But as we're talking about moving with these VFib patients, um, keep doing what you're doing. But one of the most important points is minimize those interruptions and compressions because it's hard to move a patient when you're working a code. Yeah. But remembering that those also those BLS measures of you know, keeping control of your ventilations, keeping CPR going also make a huge difference as well. That's a, that's a real good point, definitely. It, I was thinking of the vector change as, well, we're doing it this way and it's not working. So let's do something different. Let's yeah. change it up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's potential to work. And I think we've seen it work out there. It does. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of guys forget, just ask and we'll do it. You know, I try to prompt it, but 
Absolutely. And speaking of changing it up, we talked about the administration of the antiarrhythmics. And if you start with lidocaine, you're going to stick with lidocaine. You're not doing lido and amio. Same thing if you're starting with amio within that eight minute mark, you want to stick with amio for the rest of that. Stick treatment. with amio. Yeah. Pick one, stick with it. Mm -hmm. Don't mix between the two because they work on different um, electrolyte channels and you don't want to theoretically cause a, a complete. And even loss. in standard ACLS, it brings up that point. Pick an antiarrhythmic and stick with it. Which brings us to MAG, which I didn't talk about. Yes. So what I like to do is after that first shock, I don't wait. I just do amio. In that next pause, I'll give the first dose of amio, get to the second dose of amio. They're still in V-fib and I've done a vector change. I'm doing two grams of MAG, standard. And I like to get there early. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ding around 25 minutes with a refractory V-fib case and I'm finally just thinking about MAG. I would say I could get MAG on in the first 10 minutes of that. Yeah. And we give her MAG too. You did. Our patient. Fantastic. Yeah, sorry. I yeah. forgot to mention that. <laughs> so you bring up great points, great medications that we offered. One of the unique um, pieces with the hypothermic patient is you're assuming there's a lot of shunting going place. So IVs are going to be difficult to be able to establish. How did you overcome that? What did you guys do? We did an IO. Okay. Yeah, we, we looked. There was no access. Her veins were all sunken. We would have been fishing for them. So uh, Kyle, oh, hey, put in an IO. And like I said, I was driving him crazy because I was like 300 of Amio. And then next thing I know, I was like 150 of Amio. It was new. And then I was like, Kyle, two grams of mag, it's four cc's. Okay, do it. Let's cross. Check. So we were busy. He, yeah. said, he said he felt like a pharmacist. Yeah. And he's gotten really good at those humoral <laughs> too. How did you like that flow rate? It was good. Yeah, yeah, it worked really good. Yes. So talk about landmarks with us real quick, Doc, as far as the humoral IOs for those of us who haven't done them yet in the field. Yeah. So the, why I like humoral IOs, I know it's busy up on the top half of the body with the airway and everything going on. But if, if I was to compare a tibial IO to a humoral IO, I've heard it um, said like a tibial IO would be compared to like a 22 gauge IV in the finger right? Like really small, really slow flow rates, easy to not go. It's got a long way to go to get to the heart. Humoral IO is like a 16 gauge in the AC. Great flow rates right next to the heart. It's like a central line essentially. And so when I'm going to start a humoral IO on somebody, can I use you as my mm -hmm. example, chief? I do what I call the karate chop to the, to the deltoid right here. And then I put my other hand right here where my thumbs match up on the on the humoral head, importantly, the thumb, thumb goes right to the belly button and that belly button. And that will externally rotate your humoral head and then go right here. Really big target, uh, really easy to hit, um, really great flow rates. It's nice if you can can do that. And I realize with the Lucas, have you had instances with the hands in the Lucas and transporting like that? Is it difficult with a humoral eye out? Does it pop out? It wants to. We we just readjust the hand. I mean, just because they're the they're there doesn't mean we have to use them. So right. we just tie the arm up somewhere different. One thing I like to do: you can tuck. We say thumb to bum, but oh, you can okay. tuck the hand behind the back, and then the arm's not flopping, and there you can use their body weight to stabilize it. And the humerus is in the right position that okay. way too. That's a really good idea. Yeah, that is. And then in terms of cannulation, if they are ECMO candidates, then just having that area free down there to avoid having the IOs or all the other stuff that's running through there, mm -hmm. it helps with cannulation. So a great point. Well, I, fan I also want to do a shout out to Engine and Rescue 12 on this call, Chief. Like for all the joking around that we do in the station, these guys were dead serious and they got the, the gist of what was happening and they were excellent. That's fantastic to hear. Yeah. And it's a tip of the hat to our maestro for this podcast of uh, Kyle O'Hay for the great work that he does, not only in the field, but in support of, of helping these uh, podcasts come to life. So I appreciate him. Uh, well, thank you both for taking the time to Thanks, come Chief. and discuss an important case. Um, that's all we have today for the EMS uh, case studies. If you have some additional case studies you'd like to submit, please use the SharePoint tab. Uh, feel free to reach out to 7-8 with any questions. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.